At this time, would all sergeants please start the recording? PC recording is started. Thank you. All recording started. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee on Transportation. Will all council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, good morning and thank you all for joining our hearing today on moped and electrical scooters. I am Danny Rodriguez, Chairman of the Transportation Committee. First, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedure, including to recognize the council member that has joined the hearing today. Thank you. I'm Elliot Lynn, Counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which time you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the administration. Uh, first from the Department of Transportation, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, Senior Director for Special Projects, Will Carey, and Executive Director for the Bike Share Program, John Frost. And from NYPD, we also have Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki and the Managing Attorney for the Legislative Affairs Unit, Michael Clark. Um, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. I also want to recognize that we've been joined by council member Reynoso Cabrera, eh, Diaz, Holden, Kud, Levine, and eh, Sir Levin, Menchaca, Miller, Rose, eh, and I think that I have all of my colleagues there. Eh, give me one second, please. Thank you again, Elliot. And today the committee will conduct an oversight hearing on share of moped and electrical scooters. The committee will also consider intro number 2061, which I have a sponsor in, in together with other colleagues in relation to the Department of Transportation's approval for share of moped organizations. This hearing follows up on the work that the committee has done over the past year and a half related to electrical scooters and electrical bikes. In June, we passed a package of bill that legalized certain type of electrical scooters and e-bike in the city. We also passed Local Law 74, sponsored by my colleague, Councilmember Cabrera, to create a pilot program for shared electrical scooter. I'm proud to have worked with Speaker Johnson and, and the other colleagues at the council on this legislative body to get this law passed in order to give New Yorkers the opportunity to utilize increased mode of alternative transportation, especially during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. We also work very close with the administration and uh, Commissioner Trump. Moped uh, or limited use motorcycle as they are classified by the New York State Department of Motor Vehicle, offer riders in addition of motor transportation. Since mopeds can be registered with the Department of Motor Vehicle, they are, they are legal based on what the DMV uh, have established then to ride on our street as, as long as riders meet certain criteria and observe certain rules of the road. 
depending on the class of mob they are driving. But let's be clear, New York City is the one that has the power to authorize any corporation to pull Muppet in the street of New York City. NYC, the company will operate, in New York City, I'm sorry, the company will operate a sheer electrical Muppet service. Rivers and Muppets are a flow at 30 miles per hour for safety reason and riders are required to wear helmets. They are also not allowed to ride on bike lane or sidewalk. Again, anyone riding a moped must use a helmet all the time and none of them should be allowed to be in the sidewalk or in a bike lane. And I hope to hear how strictly we are gonna be from now on so that, and I, this is not against Rebel, but any company that allow a single rider to use one of those mopping with a helmet at any second or in the sidewalk, they should not be allowed to do business in our city. So far this year, there have been a number of crashes in Mobile Rebel, including four that have ended in fatalities. That's unacceptable. Just a few days ago, Homa Schnicker, an 82 years old senior, was struck by, rider, by a rider on a rebel motor and killed. He has one more victim. We need to ensure that we are protecting both the pedestrians and the riders in New York City. I will even go as far as saying that any mobile sharing company who wishes to do business in New York City again should only be allowed to be on the road if they can guarantee that their rider will be wearing a helmet while riding a moped all the time. It's not enough to take a photo. They have to use the technology, the app today to be sure that rider has helmet all the time. Early this year, Rivers suspended operation in the city while they evaluated their business model. Man, they relaunched it in late August after agreeing to enhance safety requirements by implementing new safety and rider accountability protocols that include mandatory safety training. A step to increase homeless compliance by requiring a soft fee, which is not enough, and a new community reporting tool that allows the public to report dangerous driving. It is my hope that this new safety measure will enhance the driving experience for riders and improve safety for all New Yorkers. With these safety concerns in mind, I sponsor intro number 2061. This bill will require the Department of Transportation to establish a more clear procedure by which share mob organization may apply for approval to operate share mob fleet in New York City. This process will create an additional layer of safety precautions that mob organization must undergo before receiving open access to our city street. And let's be clear with this. I have a driver's license, but even though I have a driver's license, I'm not allowed to drive a motorcycle in New York City without having a license that demonstrate that I have a skill to maneuver those vehicles. A Muppet is not different for the motorcycle. Therefore, anyone riding a Muppet, they should get some type of license in order to do business with us. The bill will also require share Muppet organization to implement safety protocol, including measures to monitor helmet use. This bill will allow prohibit, and so this bill will also prohibit the unauthorized operation of share mopper fleet and provide for the impoundment of such unauthorized vehicles. I look forward to working with the administration and my colleague here at the council to pass this legislation as quick as possible. Commissioner, we are against the clock. We need to act now. Finally, during today's hearing, I look forward to receiving an update from the administration on the solicitation to create a pilot program for share electric scooter 
in the city as required by Local Law 74 that was enacted during this summer. As of today, we know that DOT has been working with different stakeholders. I trust the leadership of the commissioner, uh, uh, but also we know that uh, we were supposed to have information on the start of the solicitation uh, by October 15. Of course, we know that DOT has been very busy working with all the issues so that restaurant street initiative, which we've been working together. And we understand that, uh, you know, they, they have been very busy. Therefore, we would like to hear today what is the plan on the October 15 that we have not get the status of the solicitation. Before we begin the hearing, I will turn it over to the committee council for some procedural comments. The acknowledgement of the council member with any new one have addressed and to administer the oath to the administration. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Deutsch and uh, clarify that we have been joined by Councilmember Levine uh, rather than Levin. Um, I'll now call on members of the administration to testify. Um, Holly Trottenberg, Rebecca Zach, Will Carey, John Frost, Michael Pilecki, and Michael Clark. Uh, I'll now read the affirmation and then call on each individual to confirm their response on the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Trottenberg? I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach? No. Will Carey? I do. John Frost? I do. Deputy Chief Pilecki? I do. And Michael Clark? I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Oh boy. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm unmuted? Good. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, joined here today by my colleagues from DOT and NYPD. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on shared mopeds and e-scooters, as well as intro 2061. Any discussion of shared micromobility programs in New York City should begin with City Bike, the largest and most successful bike share system in North America something of which we at DOT are very proud. City Bike has seen over 108 million rides since its 2013 launch and has had a strong track record on safety. The system now includes over 1,100 stations in four boroughs and a fleet of about 17,600 bikes. Let me share with you some of the key factors in City Bike's success as they are very relevant to the discussion of shared e-scooters and shared e uh, mopeds. First and most importantly, City Bike is a public-private partnership that was designed as a public transportation system from the start. And the DNA of this approach is evident in its key features. A multi-year contract, which grants the private sector partner exclusivity and an incentive to invest and deliver results for the long term. A station-based approach with strong rebalancing, which makes the system reliable for riders and keeps bicycles locked in orderly docks that help minimize clutter and inconvenience for local residents. High safety and maintenance standards established through service level agreements and other contract terms have incentivized the operator to identify and address equipment issues before serious problems occur. Extensive community outreach through which local stakeholders work with DOT to identify the best station locations while maintaining the spacing essential to the functionality of the system. An affordable membership based pricing that encourages frequent regular riding and mode shifting to cycling compared to per minute pricing, which is geared towards discretionary trips, such as those typically taken for four hire vehicles. And finally, required discounts for low income New Yorkers, including NYCHA residents and SNAP recipients that make the service even more equitable and affordable. The mutual benefits embedded in this approach and the large exclusive and potentially profitable service area have led our private partner Lyft to commit $100 million to expand and improve city bike. And they're making good on this commitment, even in a time of industry uncertainty. In 2019, the phase three expansion brought city bike service to Bushwick and Ridgewood and has continued in 2020, despite the challenges of COVID-19 into Harlem, Washington Heights and the South Bronx. 
we're also adding dramatically more station capacity through infill in the densest parts of the existing network. When phase three is complete by 2024, City Bike will serve over half of New York City's population with more than 40,000 bikes. To ensure the system is equitable and inclusive, City Bike DOT and the Department of Health have partnered with the Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation to form the Better Bike Share Partnership, which promotes ridership in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. This summer, City Bike DOT and community partners organized rides in Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx to promote cycling, including the Torta Heights, where the chair and I join residents on a bike ride highlighting the history, culture, cuisine, and political activism of Washington Heights. In the spring, with generous financial contributions from longtime sponsors City Bike and MasterCard, City Bank and MasterCard, City Bike and the de Blasio administration launched the Critical Workforce Membership Program. This program provided 19,000 free annual memberships to essential healthcare and frontline workers who've taken nearly 740,000 rides to date. So as we consider the design of shared e-scooter and moped programs in New York City, which can be a tough place to operate, as we all know, our experience with City Bike teaches us that we need committed partners with robust resources, deep management expertise, a commitment to equity, and a willingness to invest for the long haul, particularly in difficult budget times. Now let me turn to the city's shared e-scooter pilot authorized by the council in June. DOT began the solicitation process on October 6th with an industry day that was well attended with over 25 e-scooter share and related companies. We've also reached out to other cities with experience with e-scooter share programs to gather lessons learned and best practices. We're incorporating all that we learned into a request for expressions of interest solicitation for e-scooter share companies with the goal of releasing it this week. And I do apologize, Mr. Chairman, you are right. We had hoped to get it out by the deadline of October 15th, but as you point out, we've had a lot on our plates. We're gathering a lot of information. We really hope we will have, uh, we will have the RFEI out by the end of this week. In addition, we're going to be re re releasing a supplementary RFEI targeted at companies that provide ancillary services to cities related to e-scooter share, such as data analysis, project management, and inspection service. For the e-scooter share companies, um, in their RFEI, DOT will evaluate respondents on experience, safety, operations and parking management, accessibility, equity and outreach, fair labor practices, and consumer protection. We'll also evaluate responses from a robust field of companies offering shared e-scooter support services. But then once we have our submissions, we must grapple with the dire fiscal reality and hiring freeze that I've testified about previously, which will impact the type and scale of pilot DOT is able to plan and manage. The greater the geographic size, number of scooters and number of vendors, the more a pilot will demand from either agency staff or a contractor. For example, over 15 full-time DOT employees oversee bike share and our general counsel's office, our borough commissioner's offices, and senior leadership play important roles as well. And we're nonetheless straining to keep up with all the demands of the major phase three expansion underway. And as you can see in the diagram in my testimony, different approaches for shared systems using city streets require extensive resources. Designated parking areas require more upfront planning and sophisticated data management and analysis, while well, a fully free-floating model requires more on-street inspection, vendor management, and constituent complaint resolution. Many U.S. cities are now charging flat or per scooter permit fees to defray their costs regulating scooter share operations. And some cities are beginning to explore per trip surcharges as well. As you can see in the chart of my testimony, these cities are generating significant revenue from 350,000 in San Francisco to up to 3 million in Los Angeles, the city with the largest number of scooters. There is, however, a major caveat when applying these figures to New York City. For the most part, these other cities allow scooter share in their central business districts, which are the most profitable areas in which to operate. Here in New York, scooter share is excluded from Manhattan by state law, which could impact the amount companies may be willing to pay in fees to operate. That said, New York City is a market like no other, and the companies do appear very eager to operate here. While the question of resources will determine the type and scale of the pilot, I will also mention a couple of DOT's other top considerations. First, while we want e-scooter share to be a success, we do not want to hurt the continued viability of city bike. For this reason, when designing the e-scooter pilot, we want to prioritize areas outside the current and future city bike service area. Second, we've learned from our dockless bike share pilot and seen in other cities that a large number of operators competing in the same territory greatly increases the need for city management and oversight, 
and potentially makes the program's economics unsustainable. Third, we will judge respondents on accessibility, including their proposals for keeping sidewalks clear, as well as options for people with disabilities. We hope to push the industry to think creatively about e-scooter design and, if feasible, to use the pilot to test new accessible e-scooter models. Fourth, we will be looking closely at respondents' approach to safety, as well as monitoring and evaluating safety during any pilot. According to a 2019 NACTO study, shared e-scooter systems have a fatality rate five times higher than that of bike share systems, 0.21 versus 0.04 fatalities per million trips. Now let me turn to shared electric moped services in intro 2061, sponsored by the chair. New York City's only current shared moped provider, Revel, started service in 2018, <clears throat> but dramatically expanded its service area and fleet this summer in response to COVID-19. Tragically, we then saw three Revel-related fat fatalities in a short period. Revel made the decision to pause its service in July and work with the city on strengthening the company's safety culture and practices. We reached an interim agreement which required Revel to adopt a series of new safety measures that the chairman outlined them and they're listed in my testimony as well. To date, we believe Revel is making a good faith effort to abide by the terms of the interim agreement and we are seeing some encouraging results. The Revel crash rate in September was 50% lower than in June when the rate peaked at about three crashes per 10,000 trips. The crash rate for first time users has also declined and helmet use has significantly increased among Revel riders. However, as the chairman noted, despite these positive trends, on September 29th, a Revel rider collided with a pedestrian at Broadway and 60th Street, and the pedestrian ultimately succumbed to her injuries. NYPD's investigation into the crash is ongoing, and DOT and NYPD continue to closely monitor Revel's operations and implementations of its safety measures. Revel service can offer several benefits to the city. Its vehicles are zero emission. It is convenient, particularly for trips not well served by transit, and it may reduce traffic by shifting trips away from four higher vehicles. But there's no escaping the fact that moped share isn't a different risk category than bike share. Since starting operations over seven years ago, City Bike has had two fatalities or a rate of 0.02 fatalities per million trips. By comparison, in a span of about four months, Revel has had four fatalities or a rate of 1.38 fatalities per million trips. Both the interim agreement and formal regulation aim to close this safety gap, but Revel's heavier, faster, and less familiar vehicles will probably always present a higher risk profile. So in addition to requiring Revel to adhere to new safety protocols and ongoing monitoring, DOT is currently working on a rulemaking to create a formal permit process for shared moped systems. We expect to publish our proposed rule by the end of 2020 and implement the rule by early 2021. And of course, Mr. Chairman, we look forward to working with you, getting the council's input, as well as input from industry and other stakeholders as part of the public process. In conclusion, I wanna thank the chair and the entire council for your, for your continued partnership. We're in a time of unprecedented uncertainty and fiscal challenge, but we're also witnessing an exciting reimagining of our streets. We know that new micromobility options, including both e-scooter and electric moped share, could help achieve the city's transportation, equity, and sustainability goals. However, we must also grapple with the complex policy and operational questions these systems raise. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I have a few questions and then my colleague also has other questions. The first one is, can you and the NYPD give more details on uh, how many crashes, injuries, and fatality have been accumulated uh, this year uh, on share moped? Uh, uh, and what details can they also share with the last one uh, when the person also lost, unfortunately, lost their life? I think we'll, we'll let PD both has an answer, and I know Will Carey on my team has also been tracking some of okay. this data. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki. I'm the Executive Officer of the Transportation Bureau of the New York State Police Department. I can provide you with the following information regarding rebel collisions. Um, from January 1st, 2020 through October 11th, 2020, there have been 395 collisions involving rebel scooters. 174 occurred within the borough of Manhattan, 69 occurred within the Bronx, 
106 occurred in Brooklyn and 46 occurred in Queens. Uh, from August 26th through September, I'm sorry, to October 11th, there were 55 rebel collisions, 25 in Manhattan, 11 in the Bronx, 14 in Brooklyn, five in Queens, and none in Staten Island. Do you have by any chance the same data for electrical bike? Yes. I can and tell you what is your assessment on the comparison? And of course, we know from the beginning that there are more crashes involved in the Muppet is such a rebel than electrical bike. So after uh, you share with all those data, the electrical bike, if you can also do your assessment on the difference uh, between crashes involving Muppet and electrical bike. So what I can give you right now, uh, Mr. Chairman, is since August 1st of 2019 to 12:31 of 2019, there were 406 e-bike collisions uh, versus 21, 25 pedal bike or normal regular bike collisions. Uh, from the period of January 1st, 2020 through October 18th of 2020, there were 446 e-bike collisions. There were 434 e-scooter collisions for the same period. And pedal bicycles, there were 3,201 collisions. From the safety point of view, do you believe that someone who rides a moped should also have license? I will defer to you on that one. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, obviously we want everyone to be as safe as possible on mopeds. Um, you know, anything they can do to increase their safety would be preferable. The, you know, the mopeds aren't as easy as they look to operate. Um, it's one reason I, I see mopeds where I live, the Rebels, and I, I haven't gone on one because I don't feel like I have the skills for it. Um, so I don't know, we have a position on whether someone should have a motorcycle license for the Rebel mopeds. I know for class A's, you do need one. Um, but I do think people should, before getting on one, make sure they know how to operate one and understand why they're different than bikes and understand why they're different than other modes of transportation. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, what uh, Magic Clark said. Um, and you mentioned it yourself, Mr. Chairman. It might not be the case where people have the requisite skill set to operate that uh, motor scooter uh, safely. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. I don't know if you if your team also from the DOT would like to share also your own data. Thank you, Chair. My name is Will Carey. I'm the Senior Director for Special Projects at New York City DOT. Just a couple of points. Um, the primary factors we identified that led to crashes before Revel suspended operations were time of day. Crashes were more likely to happen in the uh, late night hours than they were uh, during other times of day. Rider experience. The less experienced the rider was, the more likely they were to uh, be involved in a crash. Um, and then uh, what we call single vehicle crashes were overrepresented. This means that crashes in which, uh, in most cases, the rider lost control uh, of, the, of the rebel scooter rather than collided with another vehicle. After the pause, and as the commissioner mentioned in her testimony, um, uh, Revel Institute some new safety measures and we've seen an improvement in their safety record. So the crash rate, the number of crashes um, per 10,000 trips has declined by 50%. Uh, we've also seen an improvement. Uh, there've been fewer crashes among less experienced riders, indicating um, that some of the training measures that they are taking are having a positive uh, benefit. When someone riding a Muppet is not using the helmet, who get penalty? The rider or the company? I mean, at, at present, um, if Revel, and, and I know you'll be hearing from them, I don't want to speak too much from that for them, but 
you know, at present, if they determine a rider's not wearing a helmet, I think they give them first a warning suspension and then they permanently suspend them. At the moment, the, the city is not doing anything to penalize Revel in those instances. We are tracking that data though. And I think that's something we'll be looking at in terms of the longer term rulemaking. Um, what would potentially be sanctions if we see a lot of, you know, riders not wearing helmets. Just to piggyback on what the commissioner said, prior to the uh, prior to their voluntary closure, Revel focused primarily on just giving monetary penalties to riders who didn't wear helmets. They've now shifted entirely to a suspension-based policy. So if you're found uh, to not be wearing a helmet, you get a seven-day suspension. And then uh, if you're found again, uh, you're permanently banned from the, the platform. Um, uh, both anecdotally and based on NYPD um, uh, crash reports, um, we see that helmet compliance, while certainly not perfect, is significantly improved uh, from the summer when in some cases you saw very few rebel riders uh, wearing helmets. Okay. Commissioner, what does it take for a, for a company such as Rebel to come and do business in the city? Because I think that the conversation has been yes about Rebel, and I think this is not yes about Rebel, this is about Mopri. So, and Rebel is the one that we have today, and of course we were here from there, and I wish them the best luck. I think that they are providing a good services that uh, fulfill the need that we have in our city. So nothing, Wrong when it comes to then or any company, any new a private sector that wants to do business in the city. And I know that you know everyone wants to do a good a, a business in our city because the whole thing is about if anyone made in New York City, then they can go through all the large municipalities. So what does it take then? And and this is for me coming from at some point there have been some confusion because when we talk about how can we, does the city, is the city the one that had the right to regulate a Muppet company? Uh, because at some point, you know, the conversation, when we started addressing this question, uh, what we got was, well, they are, a, they get licensed by the motor vehicle, therefore we are limited on how much we can regulate. So how much power or how much responsibility is in our shoulder as a city to allow a private sector such as Rebel to come and do business in the city of New York? And what does it take for any, is the market open for anyone that buy a number of operators to come and start renting those a motorcycle in our city? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question, Mr. Chairman. And you know, I think a little bit of the complexity of, of Revel starting up in the city and, and particularly in the early days is it, like so many things in New York, it falls a little bit on the city and a little bit on the state. Revel requires its riders to have New York State driver's licenses. The vehicles are licensed, you know, under the New York State, you know, DMV code. So, so sort of part of their operation is overseen by the state, but it is also true that the city does have under New York State law the ability to regulate shared transportation services like Revel. And, you know, again, I think as I've testified before this committee, Revel started very small in New York City. They had only 68 mopeds, I think, when they first started. Over the course of this summer, that number jumped up into the several thousands. And it became clear that the city, which admittedly had, had taken a very light touch on Revel, we had certainly been talking to them, but we had not been regulating them in a very formal way. I think it became clear that the city was going to need to do that. The rulemaking we're working on, and one, again, Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll work with you on, will not just apply to Revel. It will apply to any company who seeks to come into New York and, and operate shared mopeds. But even in advance of that rulemaking, I think we've been clear, the mayor himself has been very clear, that the city retains the right to suspend operations of any company at any time who we, uh, in terms of shared moped services, who we think is not behaving safely. That, that, that is a tool that we have right now and, and one we have not um, exercised with Revel because they, they were willing to shut themselves down this summer when we saw the, the, the three fatalities, but that is a tool the city retains for, for, to use it with Revel or any other company that seeks to operate here. 
Yeah. And I understand we cannot, you know, answer for rebel. They will have to answer by themselves, you know, how they operate, but we do know. And I know that it, it, we, we know that we don't expect anything less than that anything less than that for you because that's how also you have been making anyone that doing any uh, business related to transportation accountable uh, uh, so so uh, that's you know that's how I can define you know your leadership at DOT uh, always protecting the city interests but as you say therefore we as a city even though we cannot answer for rebel we do have the responsibility to make them accountable for defending the interests that we have as a city. So based on what they had laid out to you, anyone that is renting a market are required to have a driver license. Is that Correct. what it is? Yes, a New York State, well, I guess. I think any, and, and if you get on a Revel, you are required to send them a picture of the license. And I think, well, again, we'll let them speak about some of the methodologies they have to verify that that's your license, that you have a safe driving record. But I, I think, I, to be fair, to, to go at what NYPD said, it is also true that knowing how to drive a car is not the same as knowing how to ride a moped. Yeah, state, and, and state, also, and also, I'm sorry. State law requires riders of limit of Class B limited use motorcycles, which are the type of vehicle that Revels uses to, to have a, a driver's license and to wear a helmet. Yeah. And, and look, I, I, I was born and raised in the Caribbean, and I can tell you that Mope called Pasola in the yard is very popular. And you, if as a tourist, you go to any place in the Caribbean, many different places, you know how popular those vehicles are. Mm -hmm. So I do believe and recognize that, you know, Rebel have a great opportunity to address those, those safety issues that, you know, they have to tie in in order to continue expanding. I see a great future for them or anybody else that, you know, taking into consideration every single safety issue related to how, what are the requirements for someone to rent a Muppet. It, 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 by addressing that, area, I think that they will have a great future here in the city and other places. But I feel that, you know, it's still there's not a mechanism in place. Someone can take a photo, pull out a Muppet and pass it to somebody else. Someone can take a photo, send them to the entity and a block away because they want to enjoy a fresh air, they will tell the homies away. You know, we are in the city, and I know that all of you have been in some places where you have seen someone riding a Muppet, in this case, Rebel, without a helmet. And I think that as we will discuss, you know, regulation, they have to be penalty also. And penalty not to go after then, but it's about how they can incorporate the technology that we have today. They there should be technology there. There should be someone in the private sector that should have an app that the map the map should not be moving unless someone who is in top of the map has the helmet. So again, I. And I'm not asking you to say how anyone on your staff can monitor that part, but I feel that there should be, you know, a, 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 a consequences for, you know, beside the rider for the, any company that rents those vehicles who are riding those vehicles without the helmets, there should be some penalty. So I don't want to put you in the spot, you know, to ask you what do you think, because I know that safety is a matter that is important for all of us. But I just hope that as we will discuss the bill and, and all the ideas that you may have, that also we address how to make not yes rebel, but anyone doing business in the city, renting those type of, of moped to have everything in place 
not to try, not to make some progress, but to guarantee that anyone riding, riding those mopeds should have helmet all the time. A last question before, again, my colleague, I know that they will have questions, is how do you feel is the challenges that we still, that Rebel still have in order to guarantee that riders, pedestrians, and cyclists are safe as they renting the Muppets? I mean, I'll, I'll, Mr. Chairman, I'll give a quick answer on that. And, and I'm sure my, my PD colleagues may have some thoughts too. And I think the challenge we faced, it's something we've certainly been discussing this summer is um, for, a, for a service like Revel to succeed, they obviously want to have a certain number of people that can sign on and start using the service. The, the more I think we sort of deliberate, and I don't know that I know the answer yet about how much training we expect um, you know, those new customers to have. I think one idea we're talking about in terms of our rulemaking is potentially that you would, when you became a new Revel user, you would have a probationary period where we would perhaps restrict the times of day and the geographies until you had proved yourself an able rider. Um, but I think these are areas, and I'll turn to PD too, where we need to keep having a dialogue. Mo shared moped services, I know that I've seen them down in, in the Dominican Republic myself, but there's still a pretty new phenomenon in this country and certainly a very new phenomenon at, at scale in New York City. And I think we're still, we're still absorbing the lessons from around the world, from our sister cities and, you know, obviously our colleagues at PD. So I'm sure PD has some thoughts here too. Yeah, well, we, well uh, Mr. Chairman, I can tell you that the mission of the NYPD and, and specifically the Transportation Bureau is to ensure the safety and security of all people who use our roadways with particular attention to our most vulnerable road users, as you had mentioned, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. You know, we use the traffic stat model, which is uh, directly overseen by the Chief of Transportation and is modeled after the successful ComSat process to ensure that our precinct commanders, our precinct executive officers, identify collision patterns, clusters, and trends uh, in real time. Um, and that they take appropriate measures, whether it's enforcement, engineering, or education, to address those particular collisions. So, I mean, this is something that we're going to analyze. Uh, each week we have a traffic stat meeting in which a particular patrol borough uh, participates. That would be the executive officer of the borough, which is the one such chief like myself, and the precinct executive officers. Uh, they're required to uh, make a presentation with regard to collisions in the borough. And in their uh, specific precincts. Uh, again, they have to discuss the patterns, clusters, and trends that they've identified, and they have to present to the Chief of Transportation what measures they've taken and what measures they're going to take in the future to address those collisions. Great. Thank you. And, and with, with, a, a, with an electrical bike, and, and this is before you know, calling my colleague, a, and of course, a, you know, DOT, you was leading the agency commissioner going to be working with the stakeholders and, and trying to figure out uh, uh, the pilot the pilot program. So what is your time frame when it comes to when do you anticipate that the selective entity and do you see as one or do you see a multiple of those electrical uh, uh, one a uh, uh, being in New York, electric, sorry, electrical scooter being scooter. in New York City. I'm sorry, yes, elect, I mean electrical scooter. Do you see multiple one? Do you see as one? Uh, where do you see the challenges when it comes to the charges? Uh, uh, what mechanism do you, are you anticipated that you will be taking in place to be sure that, you know, we don't create situations as we have seen in other cities uh, with uh, multiple scooter living in the street a, a without company being responsible a, a for a taking care uh, of that. So can you share a little bit where we are? Yes, happy to. And, and again, I just want to sort of remind the council that part of this is going to be an ongoing discussion in terms of how much sort of bandwidth and, and personnel and resources we have to manage a program. Um, 
you know, I know there's a hunger both, I think, from the council's point of view and from the industry to do a very big, expansive pilot, but I need to be sure that I have the personnel to do that well, to get, I think, precisely, Mr. Chairman, at, at some of the questions you're raising. We have talked to a lot of our sister cities about scooters. I have ridden them in a bunch of different cities. Sort of what, what we typically hear usually is the sweet spot seems to be around three or four operators. And again, I think here in the New York context, we want operators that are well resourced, that are good partners, that care about equity, accessibility, and safety. Um, you know, we are going to work through in terms of the charging and other things. I think, you know, if we have the resources to do it, we'll probably like to experiment with a couple of different models, maybe places where the scooters can be charged on the sidewalk, places where, you know, we will have them perhaps be required to lock to infrastructure, have docks for them, maybe some areas where they'll be undocked. I think we're going to, again, see what kind of responses we get from the industry. And obviously, of course, be you know, I think in, in close contact and discussion with you all and other stakeholders, particularly in your districts, about what we all think makes sense in terms of the pilot parameters. Great. My, my, I just want to, you know, just make the recommendation. That I understand that we need to work with institutions that they are uh, well financed in order to provide the services here, but uh, I hope that also you look at how if some of them, if you will be at the end choosing a few of those, few of those, a few of them, now also having in mind that sometimes there can be one of those few that you choose that don't necessarily have the headphone behind, you know, and again, no one that I have a particular interest to promote it, but, you know, the, yes, to look at the definition of how also to create opportunity and I understand that, you know, at this time where we are dealing with the financial crisis or $87 billion budget, similar to what we have in 2011, and, and we, we are short of, of, of funding and we need to attract a, a institution that they can take care of establishing the slope and expanding. But it is have that in mind, it's a suggestion that, you know, always look for besides having, you know, the kid one, that they are well financed also to work around a providing opportunity also to, again, anyone that they can approach DOT that also not necessarily has all those funding, but sometimes they are more creative, they are more community related. So it's a right, Mr. Chairman, let me respond to that. And I think also if you all could unmute Will Carey, he, he may have an answer too. Uh, you're absolutely right. We're not only going to be looking at, at whether the, the applicants are, are well funded. I mean, if someone has what we think is an incredibly promising safety technology or, or whatever it might be, of course, we'll take that into consideration. But I, I think just what the experience of other cities, you know, is that like having 10 of these different companies on the ground is sort of not feasible in terms of management for the city and just perhaps creates more chaos than we want. So Again, we will work with you all, I think, to find the sweet spot of, you know, a good group of companies that demonstrate different technologies and different capacities, but, but have it be something that's also manageable. And I know, Will, did you have something to add? No, you covered it, Commissioner. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank goodness. Uh, let me go back now <laughs> to Elliot. Uh, and of course, like with the electrical bike, you know, I don't want to be putting one on the spot, but I, so I also hope that you know, we continue working, especially with the delivery workers community, uh, for them not to be the target. Uh, uh, we know that, you know, there have been all those cases of uh, overdue enforcement uh, toward that sector. And I feel that, especially during the coronavirus, uh, they, especially the fast food uh, or, or the food delivery workers, uh, were the ones that we rely on uh, to bring food to our apartment. So let's continue working together with that sector. Again, not compromising on the safety of anyone, but to be sure that they are not the target of enforcement. Eh, antes de pasar, quiero decir en español de que estamos aquí sosteniendo la audiencia eh, para analizar cómo están funcionando la industria de las pasolas, el Rebel, que son la, que, la primera que están en la ciudad. Hemos tenido algunos casos de choque donde han muerto tres personas y queremos asegurarnos de que se tomen todas las medidas necesarias para que la compañía 
siga operando si tiene la seguridad en, eh, eh, resuelta. Eh, yo he estado trabajando junto con el congresista España, eh, ya que el norte de Manhattan ha sido uno de los lugares donde teníamos una mayor cantidad de pasolas. No estamos en contra de que las pasolas estén en la calle, pero sí necesitamos que sean seguras, que no estén en la acera, que no anden a alta velocidad y que siempre anden con un caco protector. Cuidado, let me go back to it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Cohen and Levin. Uh, we'll now call on Council Members for questions in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council Members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Uh, Council Member Reynoso will be first and he will be followed by Council Member Cabrera. Council Member Reynoso. Time starts Thank now. You. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, I don't really know where to start, but I'm going to try my best to do this in five minutes, Commissioner. Uh, you mentioned four things that are extremely important uh, when it comes to uh, who you want in the city of New York when it comes to uh, operators of these type of uh, uh, transportation alternatives. You mentioned a collaboration with the Department of Transportation and the NYPD, equity in where these uh, their, their uh, vehicles would be used, uh, safety being of paramount concern for the company and a uh, well-resourced company. Uh, would you say that Revel is all four of these? Mm. Or, or um, has, do they, do they collaborate with the Department of Transportation? Yes, I would say they have been very collaborative. Do they, are they equitable? Are they putting their, uh, their uh, vehicles exclusively in white affluent areas, for example? I mean, I'd have to say no. Part of their big expansion this Bronx was to go up into northern Manhattan and uh, in, in into the Bronx. So I, I and again, I'm I'm not here to be the spokesperson for, for Revel. Um, they're a company we've just started really to get to know this yeah. summer. And yeah. I, you know, I'm not going to be an endless defender of everything they do, but I do think they they have tried to expand into a diversity of neighborhoods around the city. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'm not asking you to be a spokesperson. I just wanted you to speak to your experience as the Commissioner of Transportation with the company. So um, if it's a good experience, then say it's a good one. If it's a bad one, say it's a bad one. But so far, you said that they've worked with you. They did equity in, in where they place their, their mopeds. It's something they do. Um, safety. Um, did, they, did the Department of Transportation impose the suspension or did Revel impose their suspension when they saw safety concerns? Revel voluntarily decided to take their vehicles, uh, you know, suspend their operations. But look, it's no secret that certainly the city, both us and NYPD and, and, and City Hall had certainly raised a lot of concerns with them. Right. And, I've been and raising those concerns over the course of the summer. Yeah, I'm not, I guess I'm not questioning on whether or not the city thought it would be prudent to shut them down. But once they saw that um, that was a path that might be, we might be moving towards, they self-imposed the suspension in an effort Correct. to work with the Department of Transportation to seek uh, solutions or creative solutions to try to figure out what they were gonna do. Um, and are they a well-resourced company? Are they a company that can survive in the market that is the city of New York? Uh, well, I, I think that's a good question, council member. And, and one, I think you need to, to put to the CEO of the company, because I right. my sense is for them at some <laughs> point kind of the operational requirements that we, we may put on them would make it hard for the company to be financially viable. So, so that so, is a genuine question. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's a big deal, right? Like the idea yeah. here is that we want to make sure that companies have a chance in New York City and um, over-regulation can be uh, what discourages or makes it financially impossible for us to have these alternatives to transportations um, that are not vehicles. Um, so uh, look, I really see Revel as a, a model company that we, you know, they're self-imposing, they're working with the Department of Transportation, they're, they're asking for guidance, they're moving about the city of New York with almost no legislation, but with the guidance of the Department of Transportation and the NYPD. And I think that that's exactly what we're asking for. We've seen companies like Uber come into the city with no regulation and run Madhouse. Uh, and that is not what I see happening with Revel. So I really do think that we have to be very careful about what we're telling companies that are playing by the rules and doing the best they can under the circumstances that exist. Um, and that we would quickly move to impose regulations on them as well. It took us years to even consider imposing 
rules on Uber, but we're quick to jump on imposing it on the moped. So I'm very concerned about that. And I'm, at this moment, I'm not a fan of any regulation um, related to the, any legislation that would impose regulations on Revel as opposed to continuing with the work that has been done by the NYPD, by the Department of Transportation to make this happen. Um, requiring a helmet is something that the state requires, not the city. So no matter what happens, we can't leave this hearing adding, um, mandating, uh, uh, mandating that licenses for motorcycles, I'm sorry, licenses for motorcycles is a state law. So we're preempted by the state and it's not something we can do. And then uh, the, the asking for the revel not to be able to start when you're wearing a helmet would be the equivalent of asking for a vehicle not to be able to start unless the, the seatbelt is locked in. I mean, that just doesn't happen in the city of New York. What happens is if you don't wear your seatbelt and a cop catches you, you, you get a ticket, you All get right. a summons. We should be looking for the department, the NYPD, to be doing the same with people that are not wearing helmets. And I think that, again, uh, vehicles are a much more dangerous uh, um, uh, use of our city streets or vehicles are a big problem. And we're not asking for uh, the producer or the companies of Honda or Toyota or Chrysler or GM. We're not asking any of them to make sure that the car doesn't turn on unless the seatbelt is locked. And it's a double standard that we have when it comes to vehicles versus these alternatives to transportation. And I think that we should be very careful about what we're saying to companies that are doing everything the right way, um, uh, that are doing everything the right way, and we're here talking, having a hearing ready to overregulate um, them as opposed to vehicles. So again, thank you so much, Commissioner Trottenberg. Thank you so much to the NYPD um, for being here um, uh, and. The CEO, by the way, I want to be clear, not a lobbyist, not a lawyer. The CEO is on this call as well, which just speaks volumes to me about like how important they think this is. So thank you very much. Thank you, council member. I got to say that, first of all, I, you were one of the few council members that opposed the regulation toward Uber in 2013. When Uber came to New York City, you were one of those big champions for them. Now, a few years after, we need to recognize that we failed in 2014. I think that when we hear from a, a rebel, they by themselves agree that they down to continue working with, with better and more regulation. They know that anyone who rides a helmet should be accountable to have I mean, to anyone that ride a moped should be accountable to use a helmet. And they working with us to be sure that they address that concern. People have died. Moped is not a bicycle. A moped is a motorcycle. And we need to be responsible. As we fail on Uber, we cannot fail to this company. Thank you. Chair, uh, Councilman Marina, so would like to. Yeah, I just wanna. I wanna. Sorry, I, I thought I thought it would be appropriate for me to say the regulations that we were talking about for Uber were about its growth and con and and controlling its growth and talking about how the market has affected the taxi industry in general. The regulations we were talking about are not related to safety and whether or not they should be wearing seatbelts. So equating the two is not fair, and I don't think we should be getting into a conversation between a council member and a chair on regulations of the past related to Uber that are disc that are not necessarily the same as what we're talking about here. Um, thank you. Thank you, council member. We will continue working with the colleague. Yes, we failed to Uber and we cannot fail to this company. Thank you. Next council member, please. Thank you, chair. Uh, we've been joined by council member Richards as well. Uh, our next council member we will hear from is council member Cabrera followed by council member Cohen. Uh, Councilor Cabrera. Time starts now. Councilor Cabrera, we're having trouble hearing you. Still having difficulty with Councilmember Cabrera. Um, 
we will go ahead with Councilmember Cohen and then circle back to Councilmember Cabrera if he can get his audio sorted out. Thanks, that's now Councilmember Cohen. Says I'm not muted. You we, we have you now, Councilmember Cohen. You can hear me now. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I got to tell you, though, I'm very concerned about the the, the way this hearing is going. It, it's. Uh, I think everybody wants to see uh, as many uh, modes of transportation that help New Yorkers get around, travel through the city, that reduce car congestion. Like you know, Revels, mopeds, uh, it's all a great idea. The city does not have the infrastructure to support these, and there's no real discussion about that. I, I'm baffled at how we're going to like just open our streets to any, you know, any any kind of vehicle, anything anybody wants to do, and with not an acknowledgement that the infrastructure is currently adapted for cars. Uh, and you know, I, either we need to, you know, I, you know, I know there's That's been some that. discussion about the model on 14th Street. But like either we just we need to devote infrastructure to what to the to these other forms of transportation or it's not going to work. We could operate, you know, it, it's not revel the fault that people were getting killed. It's the the disconnect between this type of transportation and the rules governing our, our roads that we have now. And I, I don't think that the city has a real plan to integrate these vehicles into the city in a safe way. Could you talk about you know what you think the infrastructure needs are to make uh, these kinds of, uh, of alternate transportation safe in the city? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. I'm going to take a little exception to, to the notion that it's all on the city, these Revel fatalities. I think a lot of what we've seen, not only with Revel, but with motor vehicle occupants and motorcycles in this pandemic period has been a lot of bad um, driver behavior, speeding, you know, things that obviously we're attempting to fix through roadway design. But I think there is some personal responsibility for those that get behind the wheels of a car, a motorcycle, a moped. But, but that said, council member, certainly agree. I think if we want to expand e-scooters around the city, just as we've done with city bike, we're going to need more bike lane infrastructure. For mopeds, they're supposed to travel in the travel lane with vehicles. They're not allowed to be on sidewalks or in bike lanes. So different sets of infrastructure needs for each mode. I, I know that, Commissioner, I know that's the rules now, but I don't know that that's a, a, a good model. And I don't know that you think that that's a good model, that mopeds integrated into you know our, our, our car traffic makes sense. Like uh, that, and, and, I, and I do understand that there is personal responsibility, but I think that if we offered people a safe, viable way, uh, again, not maybe not in automobile traffic, they wouldn't cross over the double yellow and go down the other side of the street. Do you think that that it is the best policy to have these mopeds integrate, just use the same uh, traffic lanes as cars? I mean, yeah, I, I have to say, I think I don't think that it's sort of a feasible solution to create a whole new, you know, right of way just for these mopeds. Um, I think we're, we're not a city that has that big a use of them, and I don't, I don't necessarily see evidence that they're being in the roadway has been the issue. In, in I think the fatalities we've seen in a lot of the crashes, as Will mentioned, it's been operator error. The operator hasn't collided with a vehicle. The driver, the, the, the operator of the moped just lost control, which, which at least speaks to me that it is at least as important to make sure that anyone who rides one of these has some training and knows what they're doing. I certainly think on the e-scooter side, and you know, there's been a lot of debate about this, that if we want those to be safe, it is best to have them within a bike lane. And you know, how will e-scooters and bike lanes mix together? And can we continue to build out that bike lane infrastructure as we expand the e-scooter program? I think questions we're all gonna have to solve collectively. Can, can I ask, you know, I know that the, 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 the bike lane, you know, the city started building bike lane infrastructure before your tenure. But if you had a sort of a clean slate, like again, having this model like 14th Street where we have car free streets, you know, certain car, like, do you think that that could, might be a better model than trying to adapt? Because there's been a tremendous struggle, you know, particularly on a bus route, 
to incorporate um, uh, bike lanes. Uh, do you think that this is the best model going forward? I mean, model the way we do bike lanes and bus lanes right now in New York City. No, I, I, I don't think it is the best model. Um, I think this summer we have we have tried to be a little creative about it and sort of speed up the process and make it more nimble. Um, but I also think as a city, uh, and I think these new forms of micro mobility are going to continue that dialogue. Um, you know, we, we, we need to, I think, working with you all and the community board, we need to come up with a more streamlined process. I mean, we DOT, we have a lot of requirements we have to follow as we do these projects. And it has, at times, I agree, made the process very slow. That said, and, and I know, Councilmember Cohen, this is something you care about. We also want to make sure we do have community input, input from community boards, from local stakeholders. Um, I think no matter how we do it, there'll always be critics that we either move too fast or not fast enough. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. I, ju I just feel like, though, that, you know, that more master planning here in terms of what our city streets are going to look like and the way New Yorkers want to use them is important. I know that, you know, the administration, you know, is we're, you know, got another year left, but uh, I just don't feel like there is a, 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 a sort of big vision as to how these vehicles are going to be incorporated into our streets in a safe way. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your time. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and for uh, clarity uh, uh, on the difference on the two topics that we are addressing on this hearing, one is related to moped, and the other one is about the bill that we have related to, you know, and the, the bill that we have to increase safety for anyone that will be riding a moped. And then the other part of this hearing is about the pilot project that will come out as part of the electric or scooter. So the question related to what do we expect, expect as a definition of whoever DOT will choose to provide electric or scooter is completely different from the mapping. So the mapping matter that we are discussing is about what have happened to Rebel, how are they working to improve safety? And then we are at the same time in this hearing addressing and listening from DOT also, uh, what is their plan? Uh, how they've been working in conversation with the stakeholders that want to bring a services related to electric scooter uh, to New York City, except Manhattan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we're gonna go back to Councilmember Cabrera, who will be followed by Councilmember Ku. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Time starts now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the chair, commissioner. Uh, I want to uh, first thank you, commissioner, uh, as the uh, prime sponsor of the e-scooter, e-bike uh, bill back in June for all mm -hmm. the discussions that we have, the continued dialogue uh, as late as a couple of weeks ago as well. So thank you, thank you uh, for uh, being able to, to have that level of dialogue, which I think is very important. I wanted to ask you a technical question first. I noticed that you mentioned the RFEI and not the RFP. Uh, is there a particular reason uh, why are we going with the EI instead of the RFP? I mean, it's a, it's a, I think a more, a slightly more nimble process where I think we're hoping we can do it a little quicker. We can get a broader range of responses and input from the industry. So that was just our thinking behind it. That's great. And I think just again, you know, council member having, as I told you, having had a big industry day, there's a lot of interest. I think we are going to get a lot of great responses, a lot of creative ideas, a lot of things uh, for us all to take a look at. And I receive a lot of positive feedback uh, from those who attended uh, the event. So uh, my compliments to you. Uh, for having, uh, for hosting, hosting uh, the event. I, I think it was a wonderful idea. Uh, wanted to ask you, how many e-scooters are we thinking of doing through this RFEI? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. And, and I, I think as I indicated in my testimony, it is, I think, look, obviously one dependent on what we get from the industry in terms of their proposal, although I'm just going to take a guess that they are going to propose putting thousands and thousands of scooters on the street. And then 
you know, for us, it's a management question. As, as I said in my testimony, obviously the city's in a different, a difficult fiscal position. We have a hiring freeze. My agency has a 8% vacancy rate and we've had 12% uh, cut in our operating budget and, and potentially more to come, unfortunately. Um, and I think we all want whatever we do in terms of the pilot to be well run, to be safe, to be accessible. And so I really want to make sure that I have the, the personnel and the bandwidth to do that well. And that's a, a question I think we need to resolve um, in the coming months. You know, other cities that have done this, typically, as I said in my testimony, they charge a fee and it gives them the resources to make sure that they can manage these programs well. Beautiful. And let me just say to OMB, they're listening. Anybody in the administration, let's fund DOT so they could do their job. Uh, we cannot continue having people uh, move on for whatever reason and those jobs not being uh, replaced. We need to replace them. If you're going to, not just your department, uh, but any other department. Uh, in terms of uh, the e-bikes, um, I'm sorry, the Muppets and all the comments that were made. I, I want to echo Reynoso's uh, comments. Um, look, at the end of the day, we're not the first city uh, to be implementing uh, this uh, uh, ride share program. Uh, let's, LA has successfully uh, done it, all the cities. Uh, if they did it, we could do it. Some motor transportation. Uh, uh, sometimes to me, it seems more dangerous walking uh, than riding <laughs> certain types of vehicles. Uh, so, uh, yes, we want to do it better. And I think the data that you provided uh, is showing that we moved in the right direction. I think with the, and this goes alongside with the e scooters, whether any e form of transportation, alternative form of transportation. We, the businesses today, they are facing, and we keep using this term because it's so true, an unprecedented level of pressure, of demands, of financial hardship. Uh, we need to be very, very careful that we don't do these companies down when in fact, uh, maybe it's an agency or department or, uh, or for that matter here, I think it's the NYPD uh, to do the enforcement. Somebody's not wearing a helmet, give them the ticket. Sooner or later, it becomes part of the culture, just like it became part of the culture uh, to wear a seatbelt, and now we do it automatically. So I think it's, it's a learning process for our community, and uh, I think one that uh, we will learn together, and I run out of time. With that, I give it back to the chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, next, we will hear from Council Member Ku, followed by Council Member Holden. Council Member Ku. Time starts now. <clears throat> Hello, Commissioner. Yeah. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for coming to testify and all the uh, NYPD and your staff. Now, my question is, um, it's really confusing to me, the, moped, the terms of moped, e-scooter, e-bike, you know, uh, they all look, are, are they all legal or how do you classify each? What is a moped? What is an uh, e-bike? And what is an e-scooter? It, it's a good question. And, and certainly I want PD to jump in here too, because I think one of the challenges that they've been experiencing is you were describing a whole continuum of vehicles and knowing exactly which falls into each bucket ha has certainly been, I think, a learning curve for New York City. Um, you know, typically, and there are state definitions that classify these vehicles in terms of ridership and, and speeds they can attain. But, but for the purposes of the discussion today, we're talking about um, three different types of shared systems, city bike, which I testified about, which has both regular, what we call classic bikes that yeah. you, just, mm -hmm. you use your legs to pedal. And then what's called pedal assist, where it, it has a, a little electric battery that kicks in, but you have to pedal to make it happen. There is on top of that, and, and you're familiar with it, certainly in your district, full electric bikes where you don't need to pedal to yeah. make the bike move. 
sort of next on that continuum, you come to a moped, which is, um, you know, I'm going to turn to PD to make sure I get the definitions right, but it's sort of an even mo more robust vehicle that you don't pedal on at all. You just sit there and it can go. Uh, and, and are they all legal uh, under the new estate? Well, they're, they're now about to become, some of them are about to become technically legal next month, as you know, under New York state law, the, the state legislature and the council um, uh, have passed bills and the, 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 the throttle e-bikes, the type that delivery folks use and the e-scooters will be officially legal as of November 23rd. That said, they're certainly on our streets right now. I think we all, we all know that. Uh, are they required to uh, register with the motor vehicle department? You will for mopeds and motorcycles. You do not for e-bikes, the type that a delivery person would use or e-scooters. Because I, I noticed uh, recently a lot of people use these uh, so-called uh, e-scooters now. I guess uh, uh, it's easier to use and easier to store because they are much smaller. Uh, about, uh, I worry about public safety because a lot of pe these people, when they use the e-scooter, uh, they, they ride on the sidewalks. And, and a lot of elderly people are afraid because I saw a couple of times they almost hit people. So imagine you, you ride an e-scooter, you hit an elderly people, a uh, senior citizen, and he or she fell, uh, you were, they will suffer tremendously physical damage. And if you're hit by a car, a car has insurance, but if you're hit by a moped or by e-scooter, uh, they don't have insurance. And whoever hit by them, uh, you suffer because you, you all you you not only suffer physical damage, uh, physical damage, but also emotional and financial damage. You know, uh, that's one thing I want to uh, uh, emphasize is how the city can regulate uh, you know, these uh, people when they use these uh, v, uh, so called uh, elect electronic uh, devices. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have uh, any enforcement. NYPD is you know, short staff. Uh, this is like, not a higher priority for them. But what I see on downtown fashion is a lot of these uh, either uh, e-scooters or moped, they, they, they ride on the sidewalks, or if they ride on the streets, they, they drive the opposite way, you know, against the traffic. And it's really dangerous for them, and it's also really dangerous for the public. Uh, so this is the point I want to raise is public safety. I think the city government's basic job is to provide public safety for all people. No. Thank you, Councilman. Let me respond to that. And I know PD will want to as well. And just to be clear, cars, motorcycles, and mopeds are regulated at the state level. They do have license plates and ensure and they are required to. Maybe there are some cases where people are acting illegally um, they're required to register, have license plates, and insurance. And, and that is the case with Revel. Uh, all their scooters have a license right. plate, and, and Revel is insured. You are correct, though, for electric bikes and electric scooters. Um, those requirements don't exist. And I think this is what PD can talk about, you know, how we deal with that from an enforcement point of view. It, it, it can be a challenge. Right. So, but I, I know that you, you can buy all these things on, uh, by mail order, by Amazon, you know, mm -hmm. for a few hundred dollars or to a, a couple thousand dollars. You can, depends on the, how fast or uh, how fancy this is. Uh, I don't think they need registration. Because when you buy a car, you need to register first before you, they take your money, right? They do it at the same time. But when you buy a, a, a moped, anyone can buy a moped by mail. There's no registration for it. Yeah, and Councilman McGrew, there, there is registration for mopeds. Um, so I think uh, that is, it, it's right, we, the, whether there's registration or not is regulated by state law. Um, and state law is is what has created the classes of, e, you know, e-bikes, classes of scooter, the classes of, you know, they call it limited use motorcycles, but mopeds. So it is, it is something that's regulated by state law. Um, and you're right, for the e-bikes and the e-scooters, you don't need to register and you don't need insurance for it. Um, there is in state law a violation if you're riding an e-scooter and you collide with someone and you leave the scene, it, there are violation and uh, misdemeanor penalties for that. 
Um, so you are supposed to be staying on the scene. Um, and there is an avenue if you stay on the scene for, you know, the person who can't initiate litigation if they are civil litigation, if they are injured. Um, but Commissioner Trottenberg is right. There, there is difficulty in enforcing these and uh, specifically what is legal and isn't is going to be a, very, a big challenge for our offices. Now, if someone's riding on the sidewalk and an officer sees it, they should be issuing citations. If they're riding the wrong way, they should be issued. Um, issue. So uh, in terms of that, if an officer sees it, and obviously our officers aren't everywhere, and I, you know, I live in the city too, I have seen bikes on sidewalks and scooters on sidewalks, and I, I've seen it too going the wrong way. So, and if the officer's not there, it won't get enforced. But if an officer sees it, they should be taking enforcement on those things. Um, but my problem is I, I don't see uh, many policemen on the street now. So it's, uh, it's really hard for, for police to enforce the law if, if they're not there. I mean, you, you cannot call 311 or 911 because by the time or somebody's riding on the sidewalk, because by the time they come, is the rider is already gone, long gone. So how do you improve enforcement on, on these uh, people riding on the sidewalks or against the traffic? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, as we mentioned earlier, Councilman, um, 311 complaints do come in to precinct commanders, and they are responsible to have their officers respond and conduct an investigation as to whether or not it's a, a one-time incident or whether it's a pattern, an ongoing situation, and, and they are responsible to, to address those types of complaints that way. A traffic stat, as I mentioned before, we also run a 311 complaints and we discuss them with the precinct executive officers to make sure they're being properly addressed. As, uh, as Mike Clark said before, you know, we, we can't have officers everywhere uh, at the same time, but certainly it's something that we stress that traffic stats these types of complaints. Right. Okay, uh, thank you, yeah. Thank you, Council Member. So uh, just to be clear, so is a moped a motorcycle based on the state law or is an electric scooter? I think it is, it's more like, um, it's considered, and Michael Clark will correct me, it's considered a, a class B limited use yeah. motorcycle, yeah. that's the legal, and they are required to be registered with the state and be insured, and right. that's what Rebel uses. So yes, so as we follow conversation, just to be clear that as we are addressing and listening for you on your plan on how uh, to work with the stakeholder and bringing an electric scooter to the five to the to Manhattan to New York City except Manhattan as it was passed at the state, we are not talking about moped. That part is related to electrical a scooter. I just want to be clear that everyone knows that there's a two different conversations that we are having today. One is addressing moped, and yes, one person who died is too many. And there already have been three. And yes, we are not blaming the institution who is doing business, anyone irresponsible, but anyone who decided to do business to establish in the city of New York need to take all the precautions and the safety in place in order to go and rent those vehicles and, and have them in the street. And I know as we were here from Rebel, I know that they're working with you and I don't know, Commissioner, if, if you also can add to that because I feel that this is not about that rebel one to do something different. I think that they've been open and, and they understand it, that to have a, 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 a to have the the tool in place so that everyone will a helmet all the time is a mandate that they need to follow from the state law and from the city of New York. Well, I'll, Mr. Chairman, I'll certainly let them speak to that. And just, I think to add one more thing to what Council Member Koo was saying, again, just to emphasize part of the challenge here, and you're hearing it from PD, there really is a continuum because I think some of the, what we would call the throttle electric bikes, they almost appear to be mopeds in some cases. And, you know, what the council member is saying is true. You can order a lot of pretty powerful machines online. So, you know, there, there is certainly, a, it is a, a very complicated marketplace. And, and I know between us and PD, we're trying to do our best to stay on top of it. But I, I think as, as, as Michael said, um, it's a challenging area. It's a challenging area for enforcement. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Holden. Councilmember Holden. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Nice to see you again. And uh, I want to thank the chair for this important hearing. Um, I, I have to agree with my colleagues, council members Cohen and Ku. I'm very, very concerned about almost like there's a now a free for all in in, uh, in the city with uh, all these vehicles, and it's very confusing, uh, like um, council member Ku mentioned. Um, but let's get to let me just get to mopeds and um, even like the rebel type um, moped. Uh, the skill set, as I think the chair mentioned, is very different than driving a car because I've done both. Um, I've driven a car, you know, again, since I was uh, late teen. Um, I, I rented a, a moped in Bermuda and crashed a number of times. And that was 25 years ago. And because it is more dangerous, different skill set, totally. So if I have a driver's license, um, I should have a, a license to drive a motorcycle because I have a skill set to drive a motorcycle or a moped. So I think we have to move in at the state is going to have to figure this out because we need to have people trained on on driving something like a Revel or a moped um, because it's a very different skill set. And that's why you're seeing accidents. And that's why you're seeing uh, the police officers mentioned the number of accidents. So but, but Commissioner, a bigger question. Um, we are trying to get New York City residents to ride public transportation, right? So why yes. encourage more dangerous modes of transportation in New York City? I mean, it, it's a good question, Council Member, and, and I think it's a balancing act. And I think you're hearing that from your colleagues here today. You know well that not every part of the city uh, is well served by mass transit. And some of these sort of micro mobility modes, as we call them, can you know both serve areas that are not well served by mass transit or just you know, work on trips, let's say a crosstown trip in Manhattan, where it's a lot easier to hop on a bike than it is actually to try and take the subway over. So I think they fill a niche. But I, I think part of our discussion today, obviously, is these modes of transportation, I think, are very popular. But there's no question making them fit into the sort of the dense, complicated streets of New York. It certainly it presents, as you're hearing today, I think, an enforcement challenge for all of us. And I, I think there's not a a one size fits all, particularly when it comes to the scooters. I think we're very much, I know when you all had the vote and discussed it, some of you were very excited about having scooters in your districts and some wanted no part of them. So um, we may have different solutions in different parts of the city. All right, so so that's where you you might come in and say, all right, we'll put these, these uh, uh, e-scooters in areas that are not served very well by public transportation to balance it out possibly and not allow them in very congested areas where they're endangering everyone because you you've seen it everybody has in new york city and uh, even the proponents of all these modes of transportation know it that the vast majority vast majority uh, of people on these little scooters and uh, even you know all different types are not abiding by traffic regulations. Uh, the, you you see it, uh, a light delivery guys are going through it. We see it every day. They don't have a license plate. I think there's a bad mix. And you know some of my colleagues who voted to de, uh, defund the cops, the NYPD. It's interesting to hear them say they want the cops to enforce helmets or other things. Um, that you know the the people riding Revel are doing, so uh, the the cops are not the can't the cops can do ever can't do everything, especially monitor every little mode of transportation that that's riding on the sidewalk illegally. It's impossible in New York City, especially with um, you know all the all the different uh, modes of transportation. But we are going to have a ha have to have a really serious discussion on um, really keeping you know. Let, keeping us safe, but also monitoring anybody going 30 miles an hour on a moped and has no license plate, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And I've seen it, they're riding on in bike lanes, obviously, you can't see them. Some of them have, uh, the lights are not uh, apparent, it's not very, it's not lit very well. Um, and I think even in, in the early days of Rebel, I, I counted and I have video, early days of Rebel, I saw, and it's in the hot summer, I saw more people not wearing a helmet uh, than people wearing a helmet. Now it's changed because maybe the weather has changed too. But I, I think 
to ask the cops, ask the police to enforce something that's out of control. Uh, and then, you know, we don't have enough officers is, is ludicrous. But I think we need a serious discussion on organizing all of this, uh, Commissioner. Uh, all right. And, and really get, get to the heart of how do we make our city, yes, viable in transportation, but let's, let's encourage public transportation. Let's talk about that more seriously than all these different other modes. Even if they're popular, still, it's creating a free for all out there. And, and I've, as, as somebody that gets around New York City, I've seen people come from all different directions now riding these um, either e scooters or mopeds, all different directions. You, can, you used to know where motor vehicles were or are. Now you don't in New York City. Thank you. I don't know, maybe if, if PD particularly wants to address, I think some of the council members. Uh, well, well I'd, like, I'd like to just ask uh, NYPD if they do, uh, I know they impound some vehicles some, uh, that are riding on sidewalks and somebody doesn't have uh, uh, an ID. Can, do we have a number of how many vehicles were impounded, whether e-scooters, mopeds or otherwise? Councilman, I can provide you with, with some information regarding the enforcement the NYPD has taken with regard to level operators. Um, it's interesting that since January 1st of this year through October 18th of this year, we've issued uh, 1,089 moving violations to the operators of level scooters. What's interesting to note is just about half of that number were for uh, operators not wearing their helmets. Um, I can tell you that. That's about 540. Uh, there were 141 issued to operators who proceeded to study red lights, uh, 71 for operators who disregarded traffic control devices, 58 operating in a bike lane, 96 unlicensed operators. So that means that they didn't even have the basic, you know, class D license that's required to operate an automobile. So, you know, we do take enforcement in these cases. Um, I don't have any statistics on impounded vehicles here right now, but we can certainly work on getting that. Thank you. And, and as Thank you know, you. back in March, we did issue a finest message uh, telling people not to enforce purely against the uh, the operator of an e-bike um, who's otherwise uh, who's otherwise complying with the VTL rules um, as sort of a COVID uh, COVID um, exception exception, and that's still in place. And then our ability to seize will be in, uh, many of these bikes will now be legal beginning next month. Um, you know, I think what you'll see from most delivery workers will be uh, legal under the new rules. So I think it'll certainly, it has been significantly fewer than it had been, and it may go down even further once all of these are legal. Um, and the rules around when we're allowed to count them has changed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And here's a reminder, it, 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 we do agree when, when it comes to, you know, everything that you say about the challenges that we have. And, and we know that a rebel city by, they play important role adding their services in Northern Manhattan and especially around the hospital, the essential workers that they needed, those motor transportation during the coronavirus. And they also understand that we have to continue making uh, them safer uh, when it comes to enforcement we also we cannot uh, uh, decrease our expectation we also know that the men and women the nypd through all the local prison i can talk about the local one 33 50 34 here in northern manhattan and also in riverdale everyone you know we need to continue working to the, together to be sure that no one is riding a mopus in the sidewalk that no one is going in different direction, that no one is riding a moped without having a helmet. So those are challenges that we have, and we know as New Yorkers, we need we will address it. When it comes to you know that part related, how is uh, can the NYPD continue doing the enforcement? Yes, we need to be sure that that's happening. And it doesn't matter if the budget has to be reduced. We reduce funding to DOE, five hundred million dollars. We reduce funding for the Department of Health close to $500 million. We reduce funding for sanitation. We reduce funding for DYCD from park because the budget that we have today is only $87 billion when we end our current, the budget that we have in June 30, which was $97 billion. So all agencies today are operating with the same budget that we have in 2011. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, are there any other council members that would like to ask questions of the administration? Okay, if there are none, we will uh, next turn to public testimony. Okay, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Uh, each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Uh, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Uh, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Um, our, our first panelist uh, will be Frank Rieg. Uh, but, but Chair, is there anything you want to add before we get started? Before the administration? No, we should, we, we should also swear uh, the new representative from Rebel, uh, and as part of the procedure, this is the entity that also they put in business, you know, as they negotiated the operation in the city of New York. Uh, uh, but before that, thank you to NYPD and DOT for being a partner, uh, uh, addressing challenges that we have uh, to continue adding new way of transportation, as support electrical scooter, as support electrical a bike, as support moped bike, I feel that we first had to take care of all the safety matter related to the operation in our city. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, as, as I mentioned, we'll hear from Frank Rieg, uh, and you can testify when ready. Can I start now? Good morning, everyone. My name is Frank Rieg. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Revel. And thank you to the Committee on Transportation for the opportunity to testify sorry, today. Frank, before you continue, don't limit it on the two minutes. So if you need to take more time, feel free to uh, expand so that you can finish your, take your full testimony. I appreciate that, Chairman. I, I, I may take you up on that and take another minute or two. So I appreciate that. Revel was founded in, in 2018. We started with five employees working out of a small storefront in Bushwick and initially launched a free floating moped share pilot with 68 electric mopeds across three Brooklyn neighborhoods. Today, Revel serves over 400,000 New Yorkers across four boroughs. Our team has grown to more than 300 employees from engineers to field technicians who have all access to the same exact benefits I do as CEO. We train and hire talented New Yorkers. And let me emphasize that we do not do the gig economy and never have. Revel has always believed in working with cities as allies, not adversaries. We've made this a priority from the start and have meeting with the DOT, council members, including many of the members on this committee, local police precincts and other community stakeholders since before our 2018 pilot and continue to do so. COVID affected all, all aspects of life here in the city, including transportation. When quarantine was lifted this summer, we saw a rash of reckless driving across all modes in New York City. In July, 2020 specifically, traffic fatalities spiked 300% compared to July, 2019, again, across all modes, cars, trucks, and two-wheeled vehicles. The abrupt and extreme change in driver behavior was unprecedented. And just as DOT and law enforcement faced this challenge, so did us at Rebel. To date, Revel has been operating since 2018 across seven major cities, including Miami, Washington, DC, Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Austin, serving over 3 million rides with over 10 million miles traveled. For over two years, we had relatively infrequent reports of riders violating traffic rules and not wearing helmets. So, suddenly the reverse was true this summer. We immediately began working internally and talking to the administration but with the situation escalating so quickly, we decided to pause service in August and devote all of our engineering and operational resources to finalize the enhanced safety protocols as discussed earlier by Commissioner Trottenberg. Since resuming service, we have seen a significant increase in helmet compliance and decrease in reckless riding, and our crash rates have returned to pre-COVID levels as Will Carey mentioned uh, earlier in the testimony. We have invested heavily in bolstering our lessons program, 
have been working with DOT to fine tune all of our training materials, including developing a brand new instructional video that will also be a part of all mandatory user onboarding training. We're proud of what has been achieved to date, but we are also aware there is no silver bullet for traffic safety. In order for the city to achieve vision zero, companies like Revel absolutely need to do our part. For this, for us, this means taking a thoughtful results-driven approach and adapting as conditions on our streets change like we did this past summer. We take our responsibility of operating the public right of way seriously and will continue to improve and adapt as long as we are operating. We look forward to DOT promulgating rules to regulate mopeds and participating in the CAFR process. In the interim, we will continue to be a good and transparent partner at all times in furtherance of the administration, the council, and Revel's shared goal for a safer and more equitable transportation network across New York City. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Uh, and as I said before, good luck as you continue expanding uh, uh, what you have started here, as you say, with few people, you know, with great talent in our city. And, and, and we don't want or wish anything less than, uh, than this company to be a successful one, not only here, but throughout the nation and throughout the world. So I feel that when we address areas where we need to work together to improve safety, it has to be taken as something that the company, uh, when any conversation that we have with you, you agree that we, there's a still challenges that we have. So first question is, what do you think, what do you think that someone who ride a a, helmet, a, 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 a mop and shoe wear a helmet? So Chairman Rodriguez, just to be super clear with everybody on this call, wearing a helmet while riding a class B moped, which is a motor vehicle under state law and every single rebel has a license plate and is fully insured, under state law to ride that vehicle, you have to wear a helmet, it is state law. Um, so that is just first and foremost. Since we launched in 2018, we have always provided two DOT approved helmets on every single Rebel for riders to use. Um, and since our relaunch at the end of August, we have put into place industry leading technology in terms of a helmet selfie before every single ride. And Chairman, just to emphasize, this isn't a helmet selfie before maybe your first ride and then your 10th ride and then your 20th ride. This is every single time you ride Rebel. And when as a passenger, they also need to take a helmet selfie as well. And then these aren't just going to some black box of some company and never looked at. Every single one is reviewed. And to date, Councilmember Rodriguez, I know you mentioned accountability and responsibility when it comes to helmet use and companies like us. We have permanently suspended, since we relaunched, several thousand paying customers that will never use Rebel again because they didn't take our rule seriously on wearing a helmet. So I, I think we are doing our best to change rider behavior. And I think from multiple folks on this call so far, uh, anecdotally and also just real data from NYPD and traffic enforcement, it's working, which is great to see. So wait, are you working with some a tech company to address and, and you know how to a, guarantee that whoever ride a moped as you continue growing will have a helmet all the time? So Chairman Rodriguez, again, let's play something out here. You're a user, you start your rebel ride, the helmet case opens, you go into the helmet case, you put the helmet on, you are then asked in the app in the start process of that ride to then take a photo of that helmet secured on your head and strapped in. We then review that photo. If that user then willfully takes that helmet off at some point during the ride and puts it back in the helmet case, that is going to be something extremely hard to control. What we are trying to do, and I mentioned this just a minute ago, is again, change user behavior which I think since our relaunch, we have really made good progress. Because I think anyone on this call back in June and July, as this city was coming out of quarantine, and as I mentioned during the testimony, sort of there were a lot of changes in terms of street safety in general, way beyond Rebel. The amount of helmet compliance was something I don't think anybody was satisfied with. But I think we are getting to a point now through our technology, through the helmet selfie, 
through our compliance and checking every single one. And guess what? We are permanently suspending users that do not take it seriously. We are getting to a place where we are in a much better position than we were two or three months ago, which I'm really excited to report. Uh, you think that you think the technology already is like when and and I'm pretty sure that you know it's like the whole community of tech, you know, share information. It's like when you order an Uber and you get to see when your car is approaching your location. Isn't there a technology already that can monitor a, a someone riding a, a home and moped and knowing where is someone remove the, the, the helmet from their head? So in terms of technology of seeing an Uber on your app and understanding where that car is, we absolutely use that same technology. It's GPS technology, it's proven, it's in every single Rebel as well. And you see on our the, app where every single can Rebel is. Can the technology, can the technology it, also, is that technology they are also outside there or have you been talking to someone in the tech community that will allow for you as a company to monitor and be able through the app to be sure that, that you know when someone removed the helmet. Yep. So as part of our process and our pause suspending service this summer, every single one of my engineers, every single one of my product managers, every single one of my operations team, we spent every single resource surveying the market from a technology perspective. Sensors that supposedly go into helmets, we talked to all sorts of startups and different companies in that space. We talked to companies about a camera on maybe the front of the Revel, uh, both looking out and inward at the person. We looked at every technology solution, Chairman Rodriguez. With a fleet of over, with 3,000 mopeds here in New York City and over 6,000 nationally, with the integration of hardware and software, there is no magic sensor out there in the marketplace that is ready to be used in a service like ours. Where is that sensor getting power from? How is that sensor sending data to us? How is it reliable? What happens about the 10 to 20% of Rebel users that use their own private helmet? So once you start looking at all of the technology out there from helmet case sensors to helmet sensors in the helmet itself, to video cameras on the Rebel itself, nothing is ready, Chairman Rodriguez. But what I can tell you is that Rebel we're not sitting here saying we are perfect. We're not going to sit here and rest on our laurels and say what we've done on safety, that's it. We are constantly pushing the envelope in every single facet of our business to increase safety. And if there is a helmet sensor a year from now that is available on the market that can realistically and is reliable and can be put into a system that makes sense, and also the 10 to 20% of people that use their own helmet, there's a way to sense whether they're wearing a helmet, we will do that, Chairman Rodriguez. But right now, the technology, the way it is, helmet selfie is the most innovative thing that our company can do. And the best thing is, it's not just a talking point, Chairman. We are changing behavior. This is real. People see it in the streets. The amount of folks wearing helmets while riding Revel has exponentially increased since the summer. And that is, if there is something I'm proud about, that is one of them. So the good thing is about that you have your engineer to be looking at it and that you open to, you know, a, a insert, you know, some type of sensor if the product will be available, you know, a, 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 at some point. And this is something that you understand that at some point we need to do to the best of our ability to be able to monitor that whoever is writing a mop in this case, your your one rebel, they should have a, a helmet all the time. I just want to emphasize again, there is no technology right now. There is no magical sensor. There it does not exist that can be put into a rebel moped that also works across our entire system. It does not exist. What does exist that my team created, I can tell you right now, Chairman Rodriguez, there is no kick scooter company, there is no e-bike company that makes a user take a photo of the helmet strapped on their head before every single ride and then checks that photo and then suspends users, paying users, if they do not follow the rules. No company is even but, touching but, any but, of that. I, I get what you said. You have not yep. find a product, but you open it. If anyone is listening to this right now, 
in anyone from the Silicon Valley to here in the city to other places, they will come with a product that fix your company to bring a sensor. This is something that you see the benefit of installing that, that technology. I would love to have that conversation with any new technology in the marketplace, because if it's going to increase the safety of our system, of our users, um, I am all for it. That, that's, and, and that for me, that's, you know, the, the common area that for me, it is important that, that we know that this is, you know, I understand that, that the tech is not there yet, but if anyone is there, they should have a conversation with you. So I appreciate that approach. And what have you learned after the, those crashes the, where some people have lost their life uh, 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 riding uh, the mobile? What I have seen and what I have learned since I mean, you the company. So, I'm sorry, and I meant the institution or you as a person say, you know, what have, what have, how have a rebel change and still continue to adopt? And what new changes should we still expect to happen in the near future to continue improving safety? One example of that, Chairman Rodriguez, is the work my team is doing right now with the Department of Transportation around designing a new instructional video. Because just to be clear, as outside of the helmet selfie, one of the other things that we have implemented, when we relaunched on August 28th here in New York City, and it doesn't matter if you had used Revel a thousand times, a hundred times, or just once, you were not able to ride again until you took a 42 question safety training that was mandatory within the app, 42 questions. Um, and what we've learned is that when people are going through that safety training, when people are taking that helmet selfie, we're seeing real change out in New York City on the streets in terms of rider behavior, in terms of helmet usage. Um, and then in terms of, again, just going back to maybe your, your original question here around what are we doing to continue to improve? One of the things is working with DOT on revamping that instructional video, getting guidance from their team on what they want to see in it, revamping some of the questions that we ask as part of that 42 question safety training. Um, so these are things that we're constantly improving in partnership with the DOT. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Frank. Are there any other council members that have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will next call on Paul Vizcano. Uh, Paul? Time starts now. Thank you. Let me, uh, <clears throat> great. Can everybody hear me? We do. Great. Thank you. My name is Paul Vizcano, and I'm the Chief Development Officer and founding member at Wheels, a micromobility company based in Los Angeles. Uh, where I lead government relations. Given the, port the importance of socially distanced and sustainable forms of transportation as New York continues to responsibly reopen, we feel strongly that there has never been a better time to bring micromobility to the city of New York. Wills is excited to express our strong interest in partnering with the city of New York to offer micromobility service that emphasizes safety, cleanliness, accessibility, and equity. It is important to emphasize that Wills is one of the only potential operators that does not use a traditional stand-up scooter. Instead, we use a seated device that has all the advantages of a bike and more. As a matter of fact, we just won the uh, highly contested Seattle RFP for free floating scooters uh, with our seated device and we received the highest score. I'd like to briefly go through some of the advantages of our device. First, safety. Will's mission and the reason we are founded is all about bringing increased safety to micromobility. Because of our seated form factor, our device offers a low center of gravity and five points of contact between the rider and the device. We also use large 14 inch wheels to better handle uneven pavement surfaces. And we are the first and only operator that uses a smart helmet system that is directly integrated into the device. As a result of these unique features, wheels injury rates are exponentially lower than those reported for traditional stand-up scooters. We have provided staff with a third party safety report that documents this. Next is accessibility. The reality is that many people simply don't have the physical ability to ride a stand up, a tra traditional stand up scooter or, uh, or would prefer not to use one. Wills' seated form factor solves this problem, which is why we have such a broad and diverse demographic. 
Uh, we are extremely pr uh, proud that unlike other scooter companies, half our riders are women and one third of our riders are the age of 35 and older. Excuse me. Oh, time. You uh, if I may finish, uh, point being is we've, we've, uh, we actually have sensors in our helmet system. So basically if folks wanted to, and I can talk to, um, I'm happy to also speak with um, Revel afterwards. I think they've done a great job. If we can assist with these sensors within our helmet system, we know when a rider is actually using our helmeted device, our helmet, and when the helmet is actually put back in its holster. But with that said, I wanted to let you know that what, something that we hope that New York City um, thinks about when the RFP comes out later this week is requiring um, that a seated device be chosen given the broad studies that have been um, detailing the safety and accessibilities of seated devices. Um, and then secondly, um, we, we think that every scooter company should provide a helmet. Not that a helmet is mandatory for folks to ride, but at least provide that helmet. You know, it'd be silly for cars. We don't even think of cars providing, um, you know, uh, their, their, their vehicles without seatbelts. We feel the same should happen in micromobility. Um, with that said, I'm here to offer any questions and we're really answer any questions and we're excited to uh, potentially participate in the pilot program. Thank you so much. And, and thank you uh, to DOT for putting together the RFP. Thank you. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the integration of helmet uh, that you said? So do you use sensor? Is it, you know, and this is about co collaborating. So if there's something that you're already being able to find to integrate it and how does it work? So probably this is something that you should follow conversation with Frank too, from Rebel. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically the helmet, and by the way, I submitted um, an email that, that details all of this to the whole committee, um, as well as uh, photos. But basically the helmet sits on the rear, uh, the rear fender of our device. And in order to start the device, um, you, uh, in our app, it, uh, it asks you if you would like to release the helmet. You say yes, the helmet is released. The helmet comes with 30 biodegradable hygienic inliners that you peel off for each ride. So you're not touching, especially in a time of COVID, you're not touching somebody else, you know, a place on the helmet where somebody else touched. And we actually offer incentives of 20% discounts for people who use the helmets. And the reason we're able to do that is and tell that people use the helmet is because the sensor lives within the helmet and it communicates with the app that the, the helmet is being used. At the end of each ride, the, the, the driver of the, uh, the rider puts the helmet back in the holster and in, in, in the rear fender, locks it up. And, and like many micromobility companies, you do a selfie to show that you're properly parked. But um, we are able to determine because of the sensor that the helmet is back in this holster and uh, the, the rider ends its ride. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that and, and that's one, Thing that I, of course, like, is not that I don't trust what we heard from from, but for me, a little bit surprised that they have not found the technology to put a sensor with the helmet. A, the information is communicated when someone had the helmet in the head with the ad that the company should be able to have. So hopefully, again, you can have a conversation with them and see how we can collaborate. But thank you and good luck as you also are trying to come to the city. Thank you, committee, and thank you, chairman. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing uh, none. Our, oh, you know what? I was just going to mention, if I may, just because we were talking about it. We actually, uh, and it's all in your emails. We have, um, uh, we also included self-cleaning handlebars. It's called nanoseptic technology that's activated by UV light. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, again, something that I would require of potential winners of the RFP is, of course, safety, sustainability, equity, and cleanliness of the devices given given COVID. Thank you. And where, where do you charge the, the scooter? Sure, um, we are we are uh, market rate. So basically, it's typically um, it's typically one dollar to unlock. Sometimes we run um, free free to unlock programs. And it's about 20 to 30 cents uh, uh, per minute. 
Um, we also have um, an equity program where uh, these prices are severely discounted for those that need um, special assistance and uh, with respect to financial needs and so forth. Okay, thanks. No problem. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from other council members? Okay, uh, next we will call on Siddharth Saxena. Siddharth? I'm starts now. Great. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the committee and other attendees. My name is Sid Saxena and I'm founder and CEO of White Fox Scooters, the first fully dock-to-dock -dock or station-based e-scooter operator in the U.S. Being locally based, we believe that an e-scooter pilot program would be a valuable first step towards increasing mobility options for New Yorkers who need it most. Because of the ease of implementation, e-scooters can efficiently and immediately extend transportation options to transit deserts and currently underserved communities. These transit deserts have difficult access to public transportation or ride share, and in some cases, residents of these areas must travel three or more miles to access a single subway line. Additionally, with the dock-to-dock -dock approach, physical infrastructure can be installed in these areas to ensure consistent rebalancing, resulting in a reliable and consistent transit option into the downtown area. Additionally, not every New Yorker is fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work from home, and many times it is the lower income populations that have jobs requiring their presence in the workplace. Not only would an e-scooter pilot program extend the reach of transportation options, but it would also allow these workers a COVID-19 friendly alternative to public transportation. We believe an increase in sustainability is also another reason why we are excited by the committee's interest in an e-scooter pilot program. A study recently released by the city said that air population, uh, pollution in New York uh, over a period of just a few months caused hundreds of hospitalizations and emergency room visits. Of course, e-scooters won't immediately solve the problem of air pollution, but they will help. The electricity required to charge an e-scooter emits only 1.6% of the carbon emitted by a car over the same distance traveled. Uh, an e-scooter pilot program is a city's chance to see how different vendors approach different problems. And part of the White Fox Scooter's mission is to reduce environmental impact. The sustainability advantages with a dock-to-dock -dock approach include less vehicle miles traveled by CO2 emitting vehicles, less theft and vandalization that results in increased useful lives of the vehicles themselves, and less pedestrian safety and traffic hazards, along with better ADA compliance. And to conclude, White Fox Scooters fully supports an e-scooter pilot program and truly believes that a dock to dock model or a station-based approach similar to City Bike could greatly serve the layout of our home here in the greater New York City area. Thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, and what about the, the same question related to the homeless? Yes, yeah, so my colleague, uh, Matt uh, Thornburg is also gonna be testifying and is gonna mention more about this in his testimony, but we have actually redesigned our physical signage at each and every docking station uh, that now will have hand sanitizing wipes at each and every station, as well as helmets integrated into a built-in helmet locker. So helmets are very easily accessible by each and every rider, completely free of charge, as long as they return it back to the next station. So helmets are a really important part uh, of our uh, integration as well. But as you hear from the preview uh, person, uh, are you also expected to use technology that uh, uh, will allow to monitor that someone who rented the home if you are choose to be one of those that participate in the pilot project will have the helmets all the time? Yes, yeah, so, so the first major step that we took, a lot of the DACA's operators, as you know, uh, Chairman Arias, in order to get a helmet, you have to go online, pay for shipping, wait for the helmet to come in and be delivered and then hope to remember it on your spontaneous scooter ride. However, with this, with having uh, helmets at each and every docking station very conveniently accessible, you'll be much more uh, ready and willing uh, to be able to use those helmets. You know, unlike a moped where helmets are by state law required, helmets are, you know, re are recommended, but not required for electric scooters. So as of now, we haven't had to integrate some of those more advanced helmet selfies or, or, uh, or sensors, but we'd absolutely be interested. We've been following some of the other vendors as well, like Wheels and others, uh, to see the, that technology 
and see when there's an appropriate time to be able to implement that in our technology as well. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next panelist will be Matt Thornburg. Matt? Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Matthew Thornburg and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at White Box Scooters. We sincerely thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify. So to begin, we at White Box encourage and support the adoption of an e-scooter pilot program because it is a sensible first step in the direction of bringing micro-mobility to New York City. First, a pilot program is an ideal first step because it allows the city to test the solution and confront real data to decide whether this is a good option for New Yorkers. Moreover, a pilot program not only tests the solution itself, but the vendors too, as I believe Commissioner Trottenberg alluded to earlier. Each vendor will bring unique attributes to the table and specifically, as Sid just mentioned, for white box scooters, that means the use of docking stations to lock and charge our scooters and keep sidewalks clear and organized. A pilot program allows the committee and everyday New Yorkers to experience the solution and different possibilities within that solution firsthand. And importantly, not only can you test the solution, but a pilot program allows the city to improve the solution. In conversations White Fox has had with other local governments that have implemented pilot programs, they've reported a massive increase in their knowledge of e-scooters and their future approaches to micromobility. For example, we recently spoke with local governments who found that much of their problems stemmed from rides occurring too late and in certain areas. And of course, naturally, there will be initial growing pains, but a pilot program illuminates exactly that type of data that can lead to improvement. And of course, there's the obvious point that a pilot program is only temporary and impermanent. A pilot program provides data, real feedback from citizens and points to improve, while at the same time preserving the city's flexibility. And I'd like to briefly discuss safety um, and relevant to the current state of affairs. Socially distant forms of transportation are at a premium right now. And at the same time, we want to avoid uh, increasing automobile traffic and an e-scooter pilot program can do just that. They're an obvious solution when it comes to safety. May I quickly wrap up, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, as far as safety, White Fox in particular, in light of COVID, is actually outfitting our scooters with self-sanitizing handlebar grips, the one that Paul just mentioned earlier, and installing sanitary wipes at each and every one of our docking stations to allow riders to sanitize their scooter before each and every ride. So not only can a pilot program provide a socially distant alternative to transportation, but concrete steps can also be taken to make sure it's sanitary. And finally, as Sid mentioned, one of the major benefits of our model using docking stations is that we have physical infrastructure and we've now been allowed to adapt to COVID and actually redesigned them to include helmet lockers that would allow riders to conveniently rent a helmet free of charge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So with that, we're coming to the end uh, of this hearing. Uh, uh, and, and as we also as the other participants, we also want for you to continue looking at the need to address the issue related to home. Uh, and again, this is a, a moment in our life where we have to bring innovation, where we have to be creative, where we need to you know, continue supporting any new mode of transportation being electrical scooter, electrical bike, moped, you know, a, a, the new way of how people are moving around, especially dealing with transportation desert. But the safety will always be a top one. So good luck as you again are also trying to participate and thank you. And with that, we come into this end and now this hearing is adjourned.